And over the past month or so, we've been speaking about the Holy Spirit and about the importance of the Holy Spirit in our life as we walk with Christ. And we look at the early church, and man, you see victory in the midst of defeat there, don't you? In the book of Acts, um, it all begins with Jesus leaving them. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, I'm going, but I'm going so that way you will be empowered. And when the Spirit comes... You will go into the whole world, first with Jerusalem, then Samaria, or Judea, then Samaria, and then the whole world. And you will have power to declare, it doesn't say this, but this is what Jesus is telling them, to declare victory. The grave is empty. So the apostles are waiting around for the Holy Spirit to come, and then one night, the day of Pentecost, one morning actually, the day of Pentecost, during that morning, a wind blows in the, into the upper room where the apostles are at and all the disciples are, and the apostles experience this interesting phenomena. There's like fire above their heads, like tongues of fire, and they're speaking in tongues in different languages, and the people that are gathered in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, people from all different areas of the known world during that time, hear the apostles preaching in their own language. And they ask them, what's this all about? Are you guys drunk? And Peter steps up and says, no, we're not drunk, for it's only the ninth hour of the day. And then he preaches this sermon that's a profound defeat. Most of the sermon is about Jesus dying. Most of the sermon is about how Jesus went to the grave, how you guys put him there when he's talking to the Jewish people on the day of Pentecost. But then he ends it with victory and says, but he's not in the grave anymore. The victory's profound. The victory's phenomenal. It inspires people to say, brothers, what shall we do? What is our response to this truth that there was death, but now there's life? What's our response to the truth that our sins put him there in that grave, but his glory, his goodness, his grace brought him out of it? And Peter says this is the response. Repent. Get over your sins. Quit living into a broken life and change and be baptized. Be immersed in water. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And here's the key. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think it's important for us as Christians to talk about the Holy Spirit because if you follow Jesus in baptism, you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit if you like it or not. Hopefully you like it. Hopefully you love it. Hopefully it's amazing and inspiring to you and changes your life. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We continue on in the book of Acts and find out that like 3,000, is that right, 3,000 people that day were baptized? More than likely, there's probably a little bit more. It's hard to count 3,000 people in a day. But a lot of people were baptized. 3,000 plus people were baptized. They joined Jesus. They walked with him. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through the rest of the chapter, we find out that they love each other, that they fellowship, that they meet together to listen to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of the bread, to prayer, to fellowship, to, I'm sure they sang together with joy. They sang songs of victory. They sang songs of death that ended in resurrection, and they were stirred by the Holy Spirit. They were stirred by the Holy Spirit. You continue on, and you find that uh, Peter and James, or no, Peter and John are preaching. They can't help but talk about Jesus around the temple. And one day, they're going into the temple to meet with the church, and there's a man that was born lame there. And the man says, hey, sirs, do you guys have any money for me? And they respond, money we don't have. We've been Giving it away to everybody who's had need. They don't say that. If you read between the lines there in Acts, you'll see that. We don't have anything. We've been blessing everybody that's been poor. But we do have this. In the name of victory, in the name of Jesus, I command you, get up and walk. The man gets up and walks. They go into the temple, and uh, um, everybody sees that this man's walking, and everybody's like, well, what's going on? And the high priest and the Pharisees and all the leaders of the temple decide to arrest John and Peter, and they put him in jail. This is Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, that was Acts chapter 3, what I just talked about. In Acts chapter 4, they're, they're, they're in prison, and they invite the men to come talk to the high priest, to the Sadducees, to the Pharisees, to all the leader of the Sanhedrin, and they, they reply. They start talking about how all this has happened. It's through Jesus. 
They declare that Jesus is the only way to God, that he is the victory. And the people reply, well, I guess we can't do anything about this because you haven't really broken any laws. So we're going to let you go. But when we let you go, there's one thing you cannot do any longer. No more speaking in his name. Another way of saying that is no more declaring victory. And so Peter and John go. They meet up with the uh, church that's meeting in a house, which more than likely, interestingly enough, is Mark's house. It's the same place they took communion. Mark is the same guy that fled naked in the garden when Jesus was arrested. Mark's witnessing all this victory. They're praying in the house, and Peter and John show up, and the house shakes because the Holy Spirit's moving them. And again, you hear once again at the end of Acts chapter 4 that the, that the disciples had all things in common, that there was no one who was without that had need, that they fellowshiped, they prayed, they broke bread together, they were a body of Christ. They were stirred. In Acts chapter 5, the chapter begins with this interesting story that we often only read this story when we read Acts chapter 5, and we kind of skip around. And you know what? That's understandable. You were taught, just like I was taught, to read by chapters. When you went to school, your history books were opened, you saw a heading of a thing, and you read that section and got the heading, right? And then you would go to the next section, and sometimes, just because there was a section separation, your mind would kind of discount that the other stuff before it connected, because there was a lack of connections. I don't know about you, but in my Bible, if I look at Acts chapter 5, there's gaps. There's words in bold that separate things. I don't think Luke meant for us to read it that way. I, I think it's good. I think it's useful. I'll be honest. I love uh, the verse separations, the chapter separations, because I don't know about you, but I would have a hard time getting Acts chapter 5 if it didn't say Acts chapter 5 here. I would have to talk about the story of Ananias and Sapphira and say, open up to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Let's read this. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceed and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay. I made an error there as I read that to you guys. I'm sorry. I read it with emotion. I read it how I know the story already. I read it as this guy Ananias is a doofus. This guy's going to make a big mistake here. Because in all honesty, has he made a mistake so far? He sold a piece of property and gave money to the apostles to help out the poor. What's wrong with that? Anybody sense what's wrong with that? I mean, you guys just gave an offering, right? Did you guys give all your entire house worth um, there and be like, yeah, I'm giving to God because I'm like Ananias. None of you did that. None of you stepped up and, well, maybe you did and praise God for you. But um, we, we don't step up and say, hey, I really feel bad about giving this because I might be like Ananias. We just don't. So let's find out what Ananias did. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. My understanding of what's going on here is that Ananias didn't do a bad deed. What he did was he lived a bad way. And I'm going to say this, I firmly believe this. I don't believe Ananias was stirred by the Spirit to sell his stuff and to give it away. I think Ananias' problem here, here is he wants everybody to be like, hey, check out how awesome I am. At the end of chapter 4, what, they didn't have chapters back then. Just a little bit ago, Barnabas sold all his stuff and gave it. I'm like Barnabas. I'm like the son of encouragement. Look how good it, me and Sapphira are. We love the Lord. We sold everything we had, and we're given all the money to you, knowing that he's lying. I don't think Ananias is stirred by the Spirit here. I believe that Ananias at one time was a believer. He's there with them. I believe he received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's there with them. 
He was probably in that room when the room shook at the middle of Acts chapter 4 when all believers were together praying and Peter and John came in and they realized that they, they've been given this mission to go into the world and share the good news. I believe that he has the Holy Spirit. I just don't believe he was stirred. I don't think he did anything wrong in the offering that he gave and giving just that amount that he gave because he was given to God and that's good. It's probably he was given more than a tithe, more than 10%. I think the wrong here is he lied about it in order to get glory for himself and told everybody, this is everything I have. I'm so awesome. He wasn't stirred. Continue on, and his wife comes in after he passes, and his wife comes into the place, and they ask her, is this everything that you guys got for the house sale? And she says, it is. And Peter basically says the same thing to her that he said to her husband, and she ends up dying as well. And the young men that took Ananias out and buried him just got back, and they ended up taking her body out and burying her. And then in verse number 11, we have a bold phrase here. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. So if we stop there with that story in Acts chapter 5, we go, wow, this is a really tough story. How do I take this? Should my offering be everything that I have? And we get into all these convoluted arguments, and I think we're missing what Luke is saying here. I think Luke is more interested in showing us that this guy is stirred or settled. If Sapphira and Ananias are really living by the Spirit or not. So let me show you my illustration. Josh Ross presented this, and I have to warn you guys, as in all illustrations, it's just an illustration. All illustrations fall short as we try to declare who Jesus is in our life with Jesus. But they all have something to teach us, and I think this is wonderful. How many of you like milk? Be honest. All right, here's, a good, here's an interesting quote. Oh, man, I love milk. How many of you, when you were gentlemen, I don't know if this happens to girls as much because I'm a guy, and like, I don't ask girls, like, hey, when you were 12 years old, did you really crave milk after you were playing outside all day? Gentlemen, how many of you, when you were outside playing all day, sometime between the ages 11 and 13, you ran back inside for a drink after you were just famished and thirsty from playing football? We used to have a green belt in front of our house, and our, 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 our drive or our road was a cul-de-sac at the end. We had this long green belt that was about 15 yards wide. It was narrow enough we would tackle each other in the street half the time. But we would play football with my, my neighbor friends and everything. We'd play for hours. Like, we, we would play for a dumb amount of time. And we would be out there till the street lights came on. And I can remember those street lights came on. I ran back home, and the very first thing I did was open up that fridge and get the gallon of milk. Made my mom so mad because I was so thirsty I didn't get a cup. I just took that bad boy out and just drank because I was famished. How many of you were like that when you were younger or are like that right now? It's, it's milk that sustains you when you're thirsty. Good men back there. I, I, know, I know some young men that love cattle. <laughs> that was me. Milk is fantastic to me. It's full of protein. It's sweet. It's wonderful. I love it. I grew up being a 2% guy. That's what this is right here. Where are my whole milk lovers? Who, who, when you drink milk, has to be whole? Do you guys like cream better than whole milk, everybody that's being honest? Or, or is it whole milk that's good for you? Whole milk. When I go to the grocery store and I get milk for Evelyn, not anymore because she's over chocolate milk now, but it had to have the bunny on it. We go to a gas station and Evelyn was looking at the drinks and the things. She would look at this immediately and have to have the bunny. Who are my chocolate milk drinkers? You drink, you have to be chocolate milk? Yeah? Way to be honest, guys. I've never really liked this one. Me either. I heard that over there. Strawberry milk. Where are my strawberry milk lovers? Wow, I think we have more. Wait, some of you raised your hand for chocolate as well. You just like milk, huh? <laughs> strawberry milk. All right. I just don't get this one. 1% 1 milk. I mean, you guys that drink whole milk, I'm with you, but I was told in the 80s and 90s that we've got to watch our fat intake, and so I was like, I got to get used to the 2%, and I eventually did, but 1%ers? Be honest, who likes 1%? Man, there's more hands up for 1% than there was two. All right. The worst one of all. Skim milk. 
Hey, hey, you gotta, those of you that are putting your thumbs down, you have brothers and sisters in Christ that agree with you on Jesus in here. Why are you being negative towards them? Who are my, we got an honest one. Skim milk drinkers. Guys, this is just water with white dye in it. <laughs> Why in the world would you drink this? So, I personally love chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk. See, this stuff right here, that's what I liked when I was famished when I was a kid. I loved milk when I was famished. It, I didn't really want chocolate milk when I got in. But man, the evening came around, and I love chocolate milk. More? More? I love chocolate milk. I mean, I'd fill that cup up with some chocolate. Some people are making faces back there. They're like, oh, that's way too much. And I love chocolate milk. And I would just fill those cups up with chocolate. And I loved it. You would just sit there and drink it with a good book, hanging out at your house. I liked reading too, I was weird. Yeah. See, when you make a proper cup of chocolate milk, you gotta stir that. Jim's back there going like, you overfilled that cup, it's gonna spill on the carpet. I'm gonna get you. <laughs> but for a good proper cup of milk, you gotta stir it, right? It's got to be stirred. I put a ton of chocolate in there. Look at it. That milk just keeps absorbing it and absorbing it. Wow, that's probably the darkest chocolate milk I've ever made in my life. <laughs> Look at that. Anybody want some? I'm going to have it first, see how it is. Sorry, Luke. You can have that one later. <laughs> you have to drink all the milk first before you get to the chocolate, right? <laughs> Here's a truth I think is a reality. I think that when you come to Jesus, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I think that we have a choice when we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, when we receive salvation. I think some of us receive the gift. And like I said, all illustrations fall short. There are parts of this illustration I don't want you to overthink. But I think sometimes we're like this milk where the Holy Spirit was put in us, but never through us. I think Ananias and Sapphira struggled with that. I think they suffered with that. I think they didn't get what it meant to live a new life, to walk with Christ. But I think Acts chapter 5 continues on. It tells us a story of a people that were stirred. Let's continue on. Verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles. Remember, the last thing we ended with is after Ananias and Sapphira, is the church is terrified. And now the high priest is rising up with all the leaders, and they're arresting the apostles and putting them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And here's what the angel of the Lord said. And by the way, angel in Greek and Hebrew can always be translated literally as messenger. And what's the Holy Spirit help us do according to Jesus? Counsels us. Gives us messages. And the angel said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. I don't know about you guys, but if I just got arrested for the second time, which is Peter and John, and they've been telling me why I've been getting arrested is because I was talking about Jesus, there's a part of me that wants to be like, uh, I don't think I'm going back to the temple. I can talk about Jesus somewhere else. You know, talking about Jesus in the church building is really easy. I, th I think I'm going to just go and talk about Jesus in the church building. But instead, they heard the message of the angel, they heard the stirring of the spirit, and they went back to the temple and talked about Jesus. Let's continue on. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with them, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So the high priest is not noticing what's going on at the temple because he's too busy being political. He's getting all the rulers of the area. He's getting the king, Herod, if Herod's there at the time, whoever's leading, whatever. They're getting all the chief scribes, all the chief rabbis. They're bringing them all together. And they send somebody to the prison. Hey, go get the apostles. We want to talk to them. Verse 22. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. 
We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. So let's reinterpret that. They gone. We have no idea where they are. There's no way they could have gotten out because the guards paid attention. They're here still, and they just disappeared. Verse 24. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. So, here's what the chief priests heard. Look, the guys you arrested for talking about Jesus are in your house talking about Jesus. Your domain, your workspace, your area talking about Jesus. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, not to talk about Jesus. Yet here you are, or yet here you have, filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you attend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. You guys seeing the difference here between Ananias and Sapphira? If Ananias and Sapphira were arrested, how do you think they would respond? Sorry, we'll go talk about Jesus somewhere else. You guys see that? If Ananias and Sapphira came in contact with people who were in need, sorry, we're only going to give however much we feel compelled to give. The apostles and everybody else that are stirred, we're going to give however we feel stirred to give. That's interesting. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. They say, we're stirred by the Spirit. We're witnesses. We can't help but talk about Jesus. Do you guys notice that um, the apostles aren't like... uh, Hey, you guys, you teachers of the law, you guys are really dumb. They, but they, they speak truth. They say, we're talking about the guy that you put on the cross, and we're talking about the truth that you could follow him. He rose again on that third day. That they're stirred to love and good works. They're stu- stirred to stepping up. But sometimes Christians are like, sorry we offended you. We'll go walk away now. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men out for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, I don't know how to say his name, Thutis, Thutis, rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400 joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up for in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and everyone who followed him were not stirred. They dispersed. They were gone. They never talked about him again. They weren't filled with the goodness of the Holy Spirit. Something's different about these guys. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. If his recipients of the letter is, he's saying to them that, hey, you guys are starting to turn away from Jesus. Get back to following him because you need salvation. I wish I could talk to you about spiritual meat, but right now you need to recognize that Jesus is better and that he is the way. But I believe he ends this letter by saying, here's what spiritual meat is. He doesn't say it straight out, but I think he says it. He says, we're people that practice hospitality. Because who knows? Some people have entertained angels unaware. We are people that respect our leaders because God has put them in a position of honor and of direction, and they shepherd us. We are people that do love and good works. We are people that fellowship together and don't quit meeting together. We are people that live into this truth that we are saved with salvation and victory, and we're super excited about the fact we're saved, but now we're more excited about the fact that others can as well. 
So my question I'll leave with you is this. What's the Spirit stirring you to do? How is the Spirit stirring you? I think for each one of us it's different because we're each put in our different places. And I don't know, maybe you do like strawberry milk better than chocolate milk. But the Spirit, if you're in Christ, the Spirit's in you. And one thing I really like about this illustration is if I put this in the microwave and heated it up and got it real hot, what would happen to the molecules of the milk? They'd be stirred. The chocolate would get thinner. It would lose its viscosity. It would begin to integrate with the atoms of the milk and become connected to the proteins and the sugars that are in the milk. The chocolate would begin to be infused as it stirs. You guys know what I'm talking about that love coffee. What happens when you pour that creamer into that coffee? You start seeing it swirl. You didn't do that. The coffee's doing that. It's hot. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus wrote to a church and said, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You are neither hot nor cold. You are only room temperature. I wish you were either cold or hot. And particularly, I think Jesus is saying, I wish you were hot. I wish you were on fire because you would be stirred. Church, let's be on fire for Jesus. Let's be on fire for the victory that Jesus gave us when he died and rose again on that third day. God's stirring you. He wants you to be stirred and filled with his Holy Spirit. Not like this. He wants you to be stirred where the Holy Spirit is every part of your life. Where you live in a life of victory. Where you have eyes and ears that are open to the hurts that are around you. And you're able to love on them in amazing ways. You're able to mix with them in amazing ways where the Holy Spirit is stirring you and encouraging you to things that you probably wouldn't normally do on your own. The apostles were stuck in prison. I'm sure they were praising God. I'm sure they were praying together. But an angel came and stirred them. Stirred them to love on everybody that was around them with the name of Jesus. To go out and speak about Jesus in the place where they were arrested. What's God stirring you to do? If you're not in Jesus and you would like to follow him, Jesus gave us a great example. Mark chapter 1, we see Jesus getting baptized with uh, the baptism of John the Baptist. Now, the interesting part of that is Jesus didn't need forgiveness of sins. He was sinless. But yet he joined us in that water. And an interesting thing is what happens next when Jesus rises from the water. Heaven opens The Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus as a dove, and God speaks and said, this is my son. If you follow Jesus, I think this is what God does. I don't think this is a bad spot to be for a little while. This is milk. We need the Holy Spirit in us. And God, if you follow him in baptism, God says, this is my son, or this is my daughter. But here's something I think that is a truth that we have to recognize. We have to allow ourselves to be stirred with the Holy Spirit. I think it's a choice we make. Not only is it a choice that we follow Jesus in baptism, but it's a choice that we live with Jesus in life. That we live by the Holy Spirit and we listen. And we pay attention to what the Spirit is leading us to do.